Louisa Gradgrind has become the young wife of millowner Josiah Bounderby in a loveless marriage arranged by her father. But a new presence has arrived in her life, Captain James Harthouse, a young aristocrat who comes to Coketown as a parliamentary candidate. Bounderby, the industrialist, faced with growing unrest among his workers, refuses to intervene when one of them, Stephen, is ostracised by his workmates for refusing to join the union, and Stephen is forced to leave the town and Rachel the woman he loves. Harthouse, meanwhile, has become a frequent visitor to the Bounderby's townhouse and is asked to become a permanent guest at their country retreat away from the Coketown mills. Thank you, Lily. Mr. Bounderby's in the sitting room. Ah, outhouse. Come and get yourself a glass of sherry. How'd the meeting go? Let them know where you stand. Oh, hardest work I've ever done. They seem to be taking to you in the town, the word is. Well, I never thought a town of this size could have many shopkeepers. House builders and druggists and drapers and bakers and butchers. They say nothing of their wives and giggling daughters. I'm sure I've taken weak tea and bad sherry with the entirest voters three times round. Ah, Mrs. Bounderby. Mr. Harthouse. Oh, you've chosen duty, Harthouse. He's a hard taskmaster. Ah, uh, duty is a word for the areas. There's no need to pretend it among my friends. This is a tedious game, Bounderby. One man calls himself a philanthropist another a moralist, and some other reckons he's a human rights man. The only difference between them and me is that I'm prepared to say that it's all so much worthless wordage. But we all know it is. Quite right. But if the country's got to have all this wordage of yours, and it seems it has for all the profit it all adds up to, it's a good thing that some of it comes from your quarter, since your crowd and mine share the same interests which are minding the law and the order and the property of the country. That's why I say it's your duty. Well, call it what you like. But I do know that I'm stuck with it. <laughs> I think the town can count itself very fortunate to have someone so well connected who's prepared to look after its interests. Mr. Harthouse seems to be applying himself admirably to the realities. Oh, yes, I make no pretense to the nobler intentions. It seems, Mr. Harthouse, you pursue all your life without pretense. I believe we all should. If nothing is pretended, everything is the better understood. Why don't you bring your horses down here? Now you're going to settle in with us. The stabling for a dozen here. Don't want to spend more time in that railway hotel than you have to. Well, it's very agreeable here. The town does choke a man. Agreeable? I should hope it is. Decent enough accommodation for a self-made man, eh? <laughs> no, the town's for work. You can't expect trees and flowers and nightingales in a working town. There were a sight too many flowers here for my taste when I took possession. Turned half an acre of them over to cabbages to help feed the servants. <laughs> the man I bought this place from, Nickets, his name is, he, uh, lost his way in the manufacturing business. <laughs> he had no sense at all. 
flowers and pictures and all the rest of the frills and follies, that's all he was good for. Started life with all the advantages. While I was living in market baskets, he was at Westminster School. Where's that man now? Driveling on a fifth floor in some dark back street in Antwerp. What do you think of that? <laughs> the man overreached himself, did he? Only to the tune of 200,000 pounds. I had to foreclose the mortgage on him. Spend all his money on things like that. I reckon it's uh, a seascape. Nicky says he paid 700 pounds for it. I only leave it up because I can't be bothered to take it down. I'll tell you plainly, if I ever in the old course of my life take seven looks at it, at a hundred pound a look, be as much as I shall ever have out of it. Mrs. Bounderby? I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't startle you. I uh, saw you from the window. Is this a favourite place of yours? Yes, it is. But you're not intruding. Good. I suspect you find us all very dull here. I hope I've never given the impression that I find your company anything of the kind. I hope I'm not being too direct, but we agree on preferring straightforwardness, don't we? Of course. Well, then, I'll say that I didn't find you by chance. I was looking for you. Your brother, my young friend Tom, you love him deeply, don't you? What about Tom? Well, I think you're concerned about it. Because, let me be frank with you, I think that Tom may be gradually falling into trouble. Gambling? <laughs> well, it's no irrevocable offence in the young man of his years. Now, let me be frank with you again. I imagine that there's not much confidence between him and his father. No. Nor would I be right in thinking between him and his brother-in-law. Well, then the boy needs help from someone else. Do you know how much he's being pressed for? Is he borrowed from you? When I married, I found he was already in debt. I had to sell some trinkets to help him. They were gifts from my husband. They didn't matter to me. I got rid of them easily. Since then, I've given him in different sums very nearly all the money I've had. And now he's asked for money and I've none. He's wanted as much as a hundred pounds on occasions. I can't help him any more. Well, perhaps too much was suppressed in him before. So now he seizes the chance of pleasure and excitement. I can't blame him for that. But I cannot forgive him for not being more attentive in every word, look, and act of his life to you. He doesn't value your affection enough. Your devotion to him deserves more tenderness and more love. I shall try to correct him of that. Along with other advice I shall offer about handling his affairs. But you should not be so much occupied by a young man's callow mistakes, Mrs. Barnaby. Your nature asks for more adult concern. Thank you.
bad even to two in his back. Two can eat back bad thing. Two two can back bad. Take it is on the back. Two can eat. Two on the grave. Two on the grave. Ah, Mr. Gradgrind. We have something to settle, haven't we? Now then, come on, two on the two on the yellow, two on the grey, two on the blue, two on the blue. Any more bets, gentlemen? Any more bets, gentlemen? Hello, Jem. Where have you been? Nowhere particular. I'd say there was a guilty look about your brother there, wouldn't you, Mrs. Bounderby? Shall we speak a few girls' names and see if we strike a bell? Do you know one with a slashing fortune? Oh, your brother is misanthropical today, as all bored people are now and then. Is that the problem, Tom? Then what man of spirit wouldn't be bored half out of his mind by the banking life? All respect your exceptional husband, Mrs. Bounderby. But Tom can't be blamed for what's so natural. I have to go back to the house. There are things to see to. I know my way, Mr. Harthouse. Tom, what's the matter? Come on, man. You're in trouble, I can tell. Oh, you wouldn't speak to your sister like that. Well, tell me about it. It's money. You blame your sister for that? She could get me out of it if she wanted to. But you've had money out of her, you dog. You know you have. I've had some. Where else would I get it? My father's tied me down with his miserable allowance. My mother's never had a penny of her own. And old Bounderby pays me next to nothing. Keeps telling me he could live on tuppence a month at my age. Where else can I get money except from her? If your sister hasn't got it, you give my dear fellow. I told you already she didn't marry Bounderby for her own sake. She married him for mine. So why won't she go and get what I want out of him? That's why we're here. She doesn't even have to tell him what she wants it for. She could get whatever she's a mind to out of the man if she'd only coax him a bit. But she's wrecked the whole scheme. There she sits with him like a stone. She's turning him as cold to her as she is to him. Tom, let me be your banker. Well, how much do you need? Is it uh, three figures? Name the sum. She can help if she wants to. If she'll just deal with him. I wish I'd known you sooner. There's no other man here any use. Well, ask me about things before you start laying a cash butt next time. I've seen much more of that side of the world than you. Now then, you do something for me. Now, I'm desperately intent on your softening towards your sister. You make yourself a loving and agreeable brother, do you hear? Make the lady smile again. That's your job. We bargain then. A letter for you, Mum. Oh, from my father? No, he's still in London. It's from Miss Jupe. A man brought it.
Mother? Mother? It's Louisa. Louisa, mother. Tom is here as well. Mrs. Crankrank. Mrs. Bounderby's here. It's Louisa and Tom. Sissy. She's with Mr. Barnaby. Mr. Gradgrind wanted it. Mother. Do you know me now? Louise. Yes. Your father said he's Pain, mother. I think there's a pain somewhere in the room that I couldn't positively say that I have got it. Sissy, <laughs> oh, you've been such a blessing, dear. <laughs> Louisa. There's something I must tell you. Yes. You know that your father's nearly always away now in London. <laughs> so I, I must, I must try to him and ask him about it. About what, Mother? What is it? You've learned a great deal, Louisa. You and your brother. Ologies of every sort. Ologies, ologies from morning to night. But there's something your father missed out. Oh, for God. I don't know what it is. I've often sat with Sissy by me. Oh, Sissy, dear Sissy. And, and thought about it. I shall never get its name now. But your father may, if I, I, I write and ask him about it. I want so much to know what it is. Sissy, give me a pen. I don't know what to call it. But he missed it up. Sissy.
bank's been robbed. Where's Louisa? I haven't seen her today. Louisa! Robbed with a false key. What do you think of that? A false key? A false key! Robbed, Hutch? Well, no. Not of very much, but it might have been. Ah, of how much? Might I help myself by yes, the time yes. Yet don't stint yourself. As to how much, if you want a sum, the sum's not so very much. hundred and fifty pounds, that's how much. But never mind the sum, it's the fact. The bank's robbed, that's the thing to mind. I'm surprised you don't see it. My dear Barnaby, I do see it. And I'm as overcome as you can possibly wish me to be. However, I hope that I may be allowed to congratulate you, which I do with all my soul, I assure you, on your not having sustained a greater loss. I'll tell you what, Hardhouse, it might have been twenty thousand pounds. Yeah, I suppose it might. By the Lord, you may suppose so. It might have been twice twenty. But, Barnaby, when was this done? Sometime over the weekend. Could have been yesterday, could have been Saturday. Now, you know that, lady. I've had the honour. No. Now, she lives at the bank. You know that, too. The main door's kept double locked at night, and the key stays under that lady's pillow. Now, young Bitzer... Bitzer? Bitzer, Bitzer, the light porter man. He sleeps outside the iron room where there's... Never mind how much. Now... In the small safe in young Tom's room, the safe that's used for the petty cash, there was a hundred and fifty pound odd. A hundred and fifty-four, seven shillings and one penny. We just have no more of your interruptions. It's enough that I'm robbed while bits are snoring and probably you as well. What do you think you're there for? You're too comfortable. That's your trouble, Mrs. Sparsett. Sir, I can honestly say I've never actually heard Bitzer snore, I will say. On winter evenings, when he's fallen asleep on his table, I've heard him what I would prefer to describe as partially choke. I have heard him, on such occasions, produce sounds of a nature similar to what may be sometimes heard in Dutch clocks. Well, while he was snoring or partially choking or Dutch clocking or whatever else he was doing besides being asleep, someone got to young Tom's safe, forced it open and abstracted the contents and then that somebody or those somebodies, we don't know how many, let themselves out by the front door, double locked it behind them using the false key and that key was picked up in the street outside the bank at 12 o'clock today. Now what do you think of that? Bound. Is anybody suspected? I should just think they were Josiah Bound to be of Cork Towns not to be plundered and nobody suspected. What would you say to a hand being in it? What? Uh, not your old friend Blackpot? Ah. Well, say pool instead of Potser and you got him. I paid him off, didn't I? And three days later he bolted, didn't he? And what's in between? Mrs. Sparsett sees him lurking outside the bank after dark, not one night, but two. But that's conjecture, surely. Oh, yes, I know. These hands are the finest fellows in the world, aren't they? I've heard all that before. They've got the gift of the gab. They only want their rights explaining to the missus passing. What warning did I give that fellow? In your presence, when he came to me seeking to know how he could lay aside the ties of his marriage, did I not then tell him that he'd come to no good? Assuredly, sir. You gave him that admonition. You're disturbed, ma'am. And so you should be. You'll stay here a while, ma'am. Recover your nerves. <laughs> what is it? What's the matter? Your husband's been robbed. You've been waiting up for me. 
do you want? Are you all right? You look so tired. Why shouldn't I be tired? I couldn't get away until the mail train. Don't look like that. I needed something to warm me. Hanging about all day and night. Answering policemen. I want to go to sleep, Lou. I have to ask you, Tom. Do you have anything to tell me? If you've ever loved me in your life, and if you've concealed anything from everyone else, tell me. Please. There's nothing to tell. Tell me the truth. What do you want to know? Tom, please. Is there anything you have to tell me? If you say no more than yes, I shall understand. Just look at me. Tell me. How can I say yes or no when I don't know what you mean? Have you ever said anything to anyone at all about that visit we made? To Stephen Blackpool? Lou, I'm tired. Let me get to sleep. Tom, I'm so frightened. Frightened? Tom, I can save you! You seem low this morning, Mr. Bounderby. Won't you try your breakfast? Mrs. Sparsit, ma'am, may I trouble you to take charge of the teapot? Yes, madam, would you be good enough to take that end of the table? It seems I shall wait till doomsday to be looked after by my wife. Oh, I'm sure Miss Gradgrind would... Oh, I'm so sorry. I find it so difficult to think of her as Mrs. Bounderby. Madam, the teapot, if you please. Thank you. Never mind offending my wife, madam. She's not one to be upset by seeing another woman pouring my tea. A little thing like that's not important to Tom Gradgrind's daughter. You're behind the times, madam, if you think it is. Oh, Mrs. Bounderby, I'm so embarrassed to be in your place, but Mr. Bounderby... Stop wait. where you are, madam. Mrs. Bounderby will be glad she's relieved of the trouble, won't you? You can take it quietly, can't you? Of course. What does it matter? Well, it's only that I recalled how precious Mr. Bounderby's time is to him in the morning. Oh, you'll be corrupted with new ideas if you stay long in this house, madam. Tom Gradgrind's children will educate you. What's the matter with you? What's given you offence? If I'd been given offence, do you think I wouldn't have said so? I'd have named it and asked for it to be corrected, wouldn't I? You know me, I don't beat about the bush. I'm sure no one ever thought you diffident. Or delicate. I've never complained about that, either as a child or as a woman. I simply don't understand what you want. You're incomprehensible this morning. Want? Want. What do I want? Pray take no further trouble to explain yourself. It doesn't matter. Really, 
live in a singular world, sir. A singular world, I would say. I recall when I had the honor of receiving you at the bank, you went so far as to say you were actually apprehensive of Miss Grant Grime. Your memory does me more honor than my insignificance deserves, ma'am. Mr. Bounderby. It's a bold stroke, but I don't mind spending in the cause of justice. The man has fled the district, hasn't he, sir? This poster's up with his name on, and my posters will go up in other towns. We'll spread a net of them. We'll have some with us when we leave in the morning, young Tom. One of my women friends can have them put round for us. Yorkshire. How long do you say you're going to be away? Three nights. You mind your damn betimes in the morning, young Tom. When I was your age, I knew the dawn better than my own face. How soon, sir, do you expect intelligence of the absconder? Never mind soon, madam. I can wait. The room wasn't built in a day. Romulus and Remus can wait, so can Josiah Bounderby. They were better off in their youth than I was. They had a she-wolf for a nurse. I only had a she-wolf for a grandmother. She didn't give milk, ma'am. She gave bruises. Take the night train. You're expected to wait for my instructions. unusual for Mr. Harthouse to retire so early after dinner, wouldn't you say? He's visiting across the country tomorrow. An unusually early start for him. Indeed. I didn't hear him mention it. Should he be asked about his breakfast? He would have asked for himself if he'd wanted me to arrange it specially for him. Forgive me for labouring the matter, Mrs. Bounderby, but does that mean he will not be taking breakfast? Hmm? I only ask because it is your custom lately not to preside in the mornings, and if Mr. Harthouse simply doesn't appear, I'm not to know his wishes. Or indeed, if he's already left the house. I'm thinking of the kitchen arrangements. The kitchen can cater as is necessary, Mrs. Sparsett. Mr. Harthouse is quite free to eat or not eat. Early or late, as he wishes. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Bounderby. Oh. <laughs> 
there is. It's nothing to you. You barely think of a man. Why think of him now? I have a husband. Yes, you have a man's name. What else have you ever had from him? Could you ever want from him? He's nothing to you. You know that. I can't go with you. Then stay. Be my lover if that's what you want. God, no, I detest this place. And I'll stay forever if I can have you. I can't be. You want me. And there's nothing in this whole country that I want but you. There's another day and a half before I'm back. We could be in London, halfway to Paris by then. Louisa, you have me more distracted than I've ever been in my life. And don't turn me away. Oh, dear. Well, then. We leave tonight. Together. Separately, then. It doesn't matter to me. Who knows? We meet in the town. The girl now. Follow me. Beat the Adele. Father. What's the matter? What is it? You drained me from my cradle. Curse the hour that I was born to that. You gave me life and then took from it everything that might have made it better than a living death. I despise and detest myself for being what you made me. You killed every impulse that might have made me happy. There were hopes, know. doubts, longings struggling to be recognized in me. If you'd known that, would you have given me to the husband I now know I hate? hate. All I've had to live by is the belief that my life is short and will soon pass. There's, there's nothing in it with the pain of trying to change it. No, no. A man has come no. into my life the kind I've had no experience of. You know him. You sent him. 
He's read my thoughts. He knows about my marriage and about me, probably more than you do. I've not disgraced you. But if you ask me now whether I love him, I couldn't truthfully say no. I don't know. I don't know what is meant by love. He's been with me tonight while my husband's away. He's expecting me to go away and join him now and be his mistress. I said yes. I could get here no other way. I don't know that I'm sorry or ashamed or degraded. All I know is your philosophy and everything you've taught me are useless to me now. You brought me to the You'll find some way to help me! <laughs> Shall I tell Mr. Gragrand you're awake? How long have I been here? Since late last night. It's about 11 in the morning now. How do you feel? Why are you here? Mr. Gragrind and I have been taking it in turns. Did my father tell you what I told him? I know a little. Please, I can't bear to see you hurt anymore. Look at me, Louisa. You'll be loved here. Here? Love? Yes, truly. Your father's here. I'll leave you together. You, haven't I? I'm sorry for that. If you've been able to confide in me before, it would have been better for both of us. I know it wasn't in my nature wasn't part of the system by which you and Tom were brought up for me to invite confidences. I can't blame you. I never shall. You always acted sincerely. I know that. You asked me last night to help you.
I thought the head was all sufficient. But I must trust all my old beliefs now. Perhaps you and I can help each other. The little changes here and there in this house. Sissy started making them the last months before your mother died. I spent much more time here since then. I felt lately that... Perhaps I'm changing as well. Lightning. Softening. Something. Something distant. Something forgotten being remembered, but pleasing. I'm sounding nonsensical. Maybe it's just an old man weakening. But I feel bound to ask because of what I've seen happen to this house. Coming from the love and gratitude there grew between Sissy and your mother. Perhaps what the head leaves undone, the heart can do silently. Do you think that can be so? I'm not too proud to believe it, Louisa. There's no pride left in me. 